cradle birthday today and a uh, big, big celebration. All right, that's about all from me. I think, Jeff, over to you. Thanks, Dale. Welcome to the second in our series on divine intimacy, shaping a friendship uh, with God. If you've got a Bible, you may want to go hunting for Genesis 14. We've been looking at the life of Abraham. There's a, a website called The Science of People, and it has an article called 257 Juicy Questions to Ask Your Friends. What they've found is that talking actually re releases as much uh, activity in the brain as food, drug, drugs or sex. So it, it, talking is dangerous. And uh, so that's why most males refuse to talk. <laughs> talking creates deeper social bonds. It activates the body. Friendship is that potent thing that brings people together. And the deeper you get to know each other, the deeper the friendship. But it takes an equal give and take of questioning of each other. Uh, psychologists call it the, the give and take. In this article, the final few questions are worth thinking about. Do you like diving into the deep end or easing your way into the water? Literally figuratively? Do you typically follow your heart or your head? And if you had one month to live, how would you spend it? If you could go back and change one thing about your past, what would it be? What's your biggest fear? Where do you go when you need fresh inspiration? What legacy do you want to leave on earth once you're gone? And what gives you hope? seems that a number of those questions are found in these chapters in the life of Abraham. And so we're going to read a little bit from Genesis 14, verses 14 through 24. But we're also going to look at some of the questions that God asked Abraham and the questions that Abraham asked God and see if we can't listen in on that conversation as to uh, what was happening in the lives of of Abraham and God as they interact. So come with me as we uh, read together. If you've got your phone or your iPad, we're going to turn to Genesis 14 and we're going to read from a moment when four kings from the east decimate five kings in the west. Lot is taken captive. Abraham is uh, lent on by three other power blocks and they say, can you lend us some of the 318 personal bodyguards that are in your home? And together, this is how the story goes. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And during the night, Abram divided his men to attack them and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobar. Uh, north of Damascus. He recovered all of the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, and together with the women and the other people. After Abram returned from de defeating Kedolaomar and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sh uh, Shaveh, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. And then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or a thong of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten 
and the share that belongs to the men who went with me, to Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them have their share. There is no doubt that the Bible says that Abram and God had a, a relationship. In Genesis 18, God says, For I have known him as my own. I have chosen, I have acknowledged him as my own. A bit later in Isaiah, it says, uh, You, my servant is Israel, offspring of Abraham, my friend. Chronicles, Jehoshaphat says, Abraham, your friend forever. And then in the New Testament, Abram was called the friend of God. There is something primary about Abram and his relationship with God that I think is worth looking at and listening in on for the sort of conversations they're going to have with each other. So we're going to bounce around and look at five questions friends ask each other. We're going to look at five chapters, five stories, five questions and five answers. So you know how to count down to when we're getting towards the end of the sermon. Here's the first question. Lot. Do you want the Lot or do you want the Lord? Our passage says that Abram was very wealthy. Over a couple of thousand in his company, his personal family enterprise. Nephew, his Lot, uh, was also growing in stature and his portfolio was enlarging. They were having conflict. But Lot is going to make his choice and it's not going to be a very good choice. It's going to be a choice that he will greatly reject and re regret. It'll cost him everything. It'll be a choice based on what his eyes see and tell him. You see, Lot was a man of sight. Abraham was a man of faith. Abraham could see the unseen. Lot could only see what was in front of him. The life of Lot is a slow descent into what one writer calls affluenza and hedonism. He's going to move his tents near Sodom. He's going to move into Sodom. And then he's going to be the leader of Sodom at the gates of the city. Sodom was known and had a reputation back then that uh, was widely known to be the centre of evil. So let's read our story. After quarrelling arose between Abram's herdsmen and Lot's, Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan towards Zor was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, uh, like, the, uh, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east, and the two men parted company. Abram, ever gracious, says, Lot, you pick. What you want you can have, and what you don't want I'll have. He grabbed the best. Abram grabbed the Lord. Lot lost the lot, Abram got the lot. You see, uh, the Lord said to Abraham after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are to the north and south, to the east and west, all the land that you see, even what Lot has taken, I will give to you and your offspring forever, for I am giving it to you. So Abram went to live near the great trees of Mamre, at Hebron, where he pitched his tents, and there he built an altar to the Lord. Just notice that. Abraham went to live near the great trees of vision, of fatness, of strength. Hebron, the place of communion and association. And he builds a reminder, an altar to Yahweh. His focus was on God. That's where he's going to pitch his tent. That's where he's going to connect with God. On four occasions, he's going to build altars all through Palestine. Lot will build none. Abram 
will bury his wife here. He will be buried here. This is where Isaac and Rebekah will be buried. Jacob will bury Leah. Joseph will be buried uh, by Jacob in this place. You see, there is a generational place of faith, of greatness. And Abram says, I want this place. He builds an altar to the Lord. Have you got an altered life? Have you got a life that has an altar, a place of worship, where God is central, where, where the highest God is the highest privilege and the highest priority of your life? Abram had an altar. Social researcher uh, uh, once uh, wrote this comment, the culture of affluence is fading now. It's being, uh, it's being replaced by a new interest in the spiritual side of life. It's this yearning that has nothing to do with church or sectarianism, but with a search for why the so-called material good life does not bring happiness. Things will never bring an eternal friendship with God. That is the spiritual connection. That's when you build an altar in your heart and says, I, I will worship Yahweh. And so will my descendants. But chapter 14 takes us to a new question. Not uh, will you take the lot, but which king will you serve? In our reading, Abram goes and rescues Lot. He's coming back through the king's valley. The king's valley is where you get to choose which king. The king of Salem, Melchizedek, is going to come. The king of Sodom is going to come. And both kings are going to offer Abram a deal you can't refuse. If the first question is, do you want the lot? The second question is, which king will you serve? Nelson Gleck, uh, the Israeli archaeologist, when he has researched this area, he s found from this period of time, every village in the path was plundered and left in ruins. The countryside was laid waste. The population wiped out. For hundreds of years thereafter, the entire area was like an abandoned cemetery, hideously unkept. This is a real moment in history. And into this moment come two kings, the king of Salem and the king of Sodom. Melchizedek, king of Salem. Melech, king of righteousness, king of peace. He brings out bread and wine at the first communion. He was a priest of El Elyon, God Most High, and he blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram by El Elyon, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, El Elyon, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And uh, king of Sodom, he says to Abram, give me the people and keep all the goods for yourself. So which king will you serve? You see, it's an interesting story. Berah, the king of Sodom, Berah means son of evil. Sodom means burning. He says to Abram, get your hands into the goods. Focus on wealth. You take the lot for yourself. Keep it all. Melchizedek comes along who says there is a, a most high God. He's a, a God who wants to bring you into righteousness and into a place of peace. He is El Elyon, God most high. Worship him. And the natural response from Abram was to give not to take. You know, a lot of people have a problem with giving. But if you know Melchizedek, the greater Melchizedek, this is never an issue. This is what it is to naturally worship through all that we have to acknowledge that this is only transient. We get to play with the toys and then we hand them back. One writer said, uh, giving is not the way of raising cash, but of the way of raising kids. 
Giving is God's way, not God's way of getting money, but his way of developing maturity. You see, God is wanting to create people that have a sense of perspective, a sense of generosity, who understand the eternal realities of this transient earthly moment in time. And they worship. They give. Abram said to the king of Sodom, with hand raised, I have sworn an oath to the Lord, to Yahweh, to God Most High, El Elyon, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or a strap of a sandal, that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I want to have nothing to do with evil, not even a, a, a shoe. Not even a shoelace. You keep all of that stuff because I know that one day it's all going to be burned up. Sodom is burning. Let me ask you a question. How close can you get to the fire and not get burnt? How close can you get to the edge of the cliff and not fall off? You see, if you're asking that question, you're in the wrong place. To ask that question is to ask the question that Lot was asking. How close can I get to Sodom and not be corrupted? You see, it's a challenging question. There's a story told of a little girl who was saved up her pocket money and she got a string of plastic pearls. She was so proud of them, she wore them everywhere, to church, to kindergarten and even to bed. She took them off for a bath and swimming. Uh, but this was her little focus. One night her dad said, uh, do you love me? She said, yes, Dad, you know I love you. He said, well, give me your pearls. She said, I love you, Daddy, but I want you to know that this is my favorite. You can have my princess horse but you can't have my pearls. He kissed her goodnight. And then once every week over the next few months, he would say, do you love me? Would you give me your pearls? But one night she said with tears, here, Daddy, it's for you. And Daddy pulled out of his back pocket a blue velvet case and gave her real pearls. You see, God wants us to give up the trinkets and trust him for true treasure. You see, Abram knew where true treasure was. But there is a third chapter, a third question, that Abraham is now asking God, can my God, can my friend deliver on his promises? He called me decades ago out of Ur of the Chaldees to Canaan, he said, I'd be a father, and here I am, childless. And the years are ticking by. The biological clock is well and truly finished. And now he's asking a question. God, those promises, are they real? Are they true? Can I bank, bank my life on the promises of God? I love the story of the Lone Ranger and Tonto. They're camping in the desert. They're asleep. And then the ranger wakes up and says, Tonto, look at the sky and tell me what you see. He said, I see millions of stars. What does that tell you? He says, astronomically speaking, it tells me there are millions of galaxies, potentially billions of planets. Time-wise, it appears to be approximately quarter past three. Theologically, it's evident that the Lord is all-powerful and we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, it seems we have a beautiful day tomorrow. What does it tell you, Kimo Sabi? Lone Ranger said, someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> you see, there is power in questions. We need to ask the right questions. Do you want the lot? Which king will you serve? And God, can you protect me? Abram has just made some of the biggest enemies in the ancient world. He's taken on the kings of Babylonia. I'd be sleeping nervously from now on. But God comes to Abram and says, Abram, I want you to know a couple of things. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. 
You don't need to fear the gangsters that were looking for protection money because I am your very great reward. And Abram says, Adonai Yahweh, Sovereign Lord. In fact, most translations don't know what to do with this verse. Is it Lord, Lord? Is it Sovereign Lord? Jews cannot say Yahweh, so they translate it Lord God. What will you give me since I am childless? And my will currently says that the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. I've picked up someone who's going to inherit the business. God, you lured me out here with the promise that I'd have a son. My name is Abram, father of many, and it looks like I am a contradiction to everything you're talking about and everything you're promising. It just doesn't make sense. And God takes him out and says, look at the stars, because that's how many kids you're going to have, Abram. Countless, 10 to the 21st power. And one of those stars would be the bright and morning star, Abram. And he will come and he will change the planet. And the Bible has a word that is repeated many times in the New Testament because this is the first time the word believe is mentioned in the Bible. This is the first time the word righteousness is mentioned in the Bible. Abram believed that promise. He believed Yahweh and it was accounted, credited to him as righteousness. Wouldn't you like the God of the universe to credit to you forever a relationship that's right, forever, eternal? Why is Abram the forever friend of God? Because when God said, Abram, I promise you, I won't disappoint you, Abram said, that's enough. I'll trust you. He believed the Lord and it was credited, accounted, not accomplished by Abraham. It was accounted for. It was put in his bank account as right with God forever. And to let you know how much I'm going to promise you, Abraham, I'm going to cut you a deal. Don't you like the way in the ancient world they cut a deal? They got a cow. They got a ram, they got a goat, they got a pigeon, they got a turtle, and they cut them in half and they severed them and and put them to each side. And in the ancient world, what you would do then is you'd walk between the two bodies. And the deal was that if I don't deliver, you know what you can do to me? You can cut me in half. So if both parties walk through the severed animals, then who is responsible for keeping the promise? Both of them. But if one walks through the the seven animals, who is responsible? So Abraham is shooing away the birds that are enjoying uh, tomorrow's roast that's severed and, and spread. But nothing is happening and it's getting later and later in the day. And finally, Abraham falls asleep. And just then he notices a fire going through the seven animals. And the voice of God says, I promise. You see, our relationship with God is not you and me. It's God saying, I promise, do you believe me? I don't do anything to earn my way into a relationship with God. God says, here it is. I promise, do you believe me? Do you want to be right with me? If you want to know the eternal God is present. Question one, do you want the lot? Question two, who is your king? Question three, can he deliver? Question four, do I take matters into my own hand? Genesis 16 is a sad story of Abraham who has just believed God, who is now going to say, God, maybe I need to give you a hand. Sarah says, well, there was this beautiful girl that we collected in Egypt. Her name is Hagar. She is very willing, because I've told her, to be a surrogate. And we can actually manufacture the promise if we do it ourselves. So, Abram, I'm asking you to go into her and get a descendant. 
that will fulfill the promise of God. What do you think of Abram now? What do you think of God's choice of friends? Abraham is going to get it wrong. He's going to be a miserable failure and even better, a miserable success in the exercise. And through this one incident in human history, the whole Jewish-Arab conflict goes down to this one choice that he's going to make. With Hagar. He's going to give birth to Ishmael. Hagar is going to run off into the wilderness. She's been heavied by Sarah. And, uh, and there in the wilderness, God is going to reach out to the mother of the Arab nations and say, You are pregnant and you'll give birth to a son. You will name him El Ishma. Ishmael. God hears. I've heard your tears. I've heard your pain. And she'll give, and she gave this name to Yahweh, who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. You are El Roy, for you. For she said, "I have now seen the one who sees me." You know what? God not only loves the Jews, he loves the Arabs. God has a plan for Egypt. God has a plan for Assyria. I'm going to call Egypt my son and Assyria my son. I'm going to bring you to Israel, my son. You know, Abraham is both their fathers. God has a plan for the Arabs, but that's another occasion. Do I take matters into my own hand? Let me ask you, have you taken matters into your own hand? Are you trying to create your own life agenda? Or do you want God's assignment? You know, there's a big difference do I take matters into my own hands? Abraham got it wrong. We can blame God for our foolish choices, but thankfully God, in spite of our choices, can still work his plan. God's friendships are powerful, not perfect. God blesses in spite of our messes, and he creates the last question. We've got to the end. Here is the biggest question you can ever ask. Is God truly El Shaddai. Is he El Shaddai? God appears to Abram. He's now 99 years old. Sarah is 90. He's promised that they're going to have a kid. Guinness Book of Records says the, the oldest mother this century was how old? Anybody know this? A prize? 74. So if you add another 16 years, it's gone out beyond the Guinness Book of Records. And God says, Abraham, I've told you over and over again, I'm going to give you a son. You've done a stupid thing. You've now created a topic in the United Nations that is going to go round and round and round. The whole world is going to be poised on the Middle East because of your one choice. But I want you to know that I am El Shaddai, that I am the God who is sufficient. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, the God from whom everything flows. I am the all-sufficient God. Abraham, believe me, I will greatly increase your numbers. And what's his response? Read it with me. Abraham fell face down. Abraham fell face down and he did what? You see, the thing about friends is they can see the things that we need to laugh about. He wasn't laughing at God, he was laughing with God. That was the sort of friendship that they had. That God, you are all sufficient, you are all I need. You are the one who alone can pour out richly, abundantly, continually, you are this one who literally means one who has his hand on everything. Let me ask you, has God got his hand on your messes? Has he got his hand on your best moments? Can he work with your failures and your successes and still, if you will, trust him as your friend, lead you to the place you need to be? You see, this friendship now is getting to know each other deeply. They're asking each other some juicy questions. 
he's now discovering that this God who is approaching him is all he needs. He's all sufficient. And Abram is now given a new name. Abram, your name is not exalted father, but you are Abraham, father of nations. What a joke, says uh, Abraham, if, if this isn't true, this is, this is to be pitied. But God, if you're promising, this is one of the most amazing moments. And that Sarai will become Sarah, the princess. And we're going to name our first child, not Noah, Jeffrey. We're going to name him Isaac. He laughs. He laughs. Because when God is in the friendship, there's not only faith, but there's a lot of fun. God is not wanting to detract from your life. He's wanting to add and to multiply because that's the sort of God he is. This God that Abraham worshipped has a name. So I want to ask you a big question. Are you friends? Are you friends? A little boy was asked, do you know God's name? He said, I know his name. It's Andrew. Andy. The mother was curious. How can God's name be Andrew? He said, well, you know the song we sing. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. That's a granddad joke for those who... <laughs> I want to tell you, his name is not Andy. His name is El Elyon, Elohim, Yahweh, El Shaddai. This God has a name. There are only two variants of that, although there are 950 titles given to God in the Bible, you may want to research those. But there are two main ones, that you are the great I am. I'm always being who I always am, and I'm Elohim, God of might, highest God, almighty God. What I find even more amazing is that Moses took the Phoenician language, which was pictographic, right to left, And he took the four symbols, hand, man, nail, man. And he took those letters and says, this is the mysterious personal name of God. It would later be rounded out by Ezra in the 5th century. But Thomas will understand the meaning of Yahweh. Thomas will say, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And Jesus said, peace be with you, Thomas. Put your finger here. See where the nail in the hand of the man was. See my hands. Stop doubting, believe. Thomas said, that's all I need. Yahweh Elohim. God of me, Lord of me. Don't get this wrong. One God, three persons. But this Jesus is God. Have you come to a point of trusting him? Queen Elizabeth did. She had a beautiful faith. I don't know if you noticed the funeral. All of the prime ministers and rulers and leaders and royalty And then came that moment when Biden walked in to the front door and they said, just wait, there's some ordinary people just walked in front. And the most powerful man on earth realised that at the funeral of Queen Elizabeth, the field is level. And when Marcus Welby, towards the end, said, one day we will see our sister Elizabeth, In spite of all of the pomp and ceremony, there came that moment when he realised that you're either a friend of the King of Kings or you're not. And our sister Elizabeth said, and he repeated on her behalf, that if you know and love him, one day we will meet again. At the foot of the cross, the ground is level. There's no kings or queens. Only family. 
only a deep woman of faith who arranged the seating for 2,000 royalty. Over 4 billion watched the moment and she made sure her faith in Jesus Christ was known. You are my friends if you do what I command, said Jesus. I don't call you servants. Servant doesn't know what God's up to. I called you friends for everything I've learned from my Father I have made known to you. Let me ask you this morning, do you know what it is to be the friend of Jesus, to have the highest privilege in life, the highest priority to be a friend of the King of Kings? As we close in prayer and as our band comes to play our final song, let me ask you this question. What legacy are you leaving on earth? Once you're gone, in three generations' time, how will they talk about you? Will you be referred to as a woman and a man of faith? Will they know that Almighty God was your friend? Will you bow with me in prayer? How blessed is our God and what a blessing he is. He is the Father of our Master Jesus Christ who takes us to the highest places of blessing in him. Long before he laid down the earth's foundation, he had everyone in this room in his mind and had settled on us as the focus of his love, to be made holy and whole by his love. Father, long ago you decided to adopt us into your family through Jesus Christ, and what a pleasure you took in planning this. And so we enter the celebration of this lavish gift giving by the hand, the nail pierced hand of your beloved Son, in whom we pray to El Elyon, to El Shaddai, to Adonai, to Yahweh, be praise and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.